Our next speaker was born in Iowa. He received his law degree from Georgetown University in 1977 and moved to Georgia in 1978 where he began to practice law. In 1986, he won appointment from President Ronald Reagan as a U.S. attorney, served in that post until 1990. He then led the Southeastern Legal Foundation, a public interest law firm. In 1994, in his very first try at elective office, he became the congressman for the 7th District of Georgia, the seat once held by the late Larry McDonald. Re-elected in 1996, he serves on the all-important Judiciary Committee, which is entertaining the possibility of bringing impeachment charges against President Clinton. His very informative interview with John McManus appeared in the August 4th issue of The New American. Uh, would you please welcome Congressman Bob Barr. Dennis, thank you, and, and I really do appreciate uh, the tremendous honor that you've extended to Jerry and I to be here. It, re it really is an honor, because I know very well of the tremendous work that this organization has done over the years in support of and the preservation of our American ideals. I always enjoy uh, being with John McManus, whether it is at one of our dinners in Georgia, which we have coming up next, uh, next Saturday, I believe, that I know some of you will be be at, uh, because the programs aren't your typical political type programs, they are substantive. And you have the opportunity to talk about real substantive ideas and listen and, and learn. Let me uh, uh, say that I found John's talk extremely informative. He raises a number of very, very uh, important issues uh, about the military, uh, about uh, some of the, uh, the, the problems that we see in our society nowadays. Uh, he mentioned Waco, and I would commend to everybody a film that came out uh, just recently. I was talking with a few of the folks in the back of the room, and they have seen it also. It's called Waco, The Rules of Engagement. It may still be out in limited uh, commercial release. I had the opportunity to see the film a couple of times during its production uh, and talking with some of the folks. And the amazing thing about it is that despite the efforts by some to marginalize it and make it appear as if it uh, is not something that is worthy of a serious uh, consideration, uh, the film uh, was reviewed by uh, Siskel and Ebert and given two thumbs up. And when they reviewed it just, uh, just about a month or so ago, I think, I think it was, they gave a very interesting review of it and said that it is a very objective film, uh, but it is also a very disturbing film because it appears that the people who were not completely forthcoming uh, in the discussion of Waco were not the civilians, but the, uh, the government officials. And there are a number of questions that remain unanswered. You all may recall just a couple of years ago, we had some hearings in the House. They were hearings that, that were very, very important, uh, extremely important, very troubling, uh, and really raised more questions than they answered. Uh, for a number of reasons, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Suffice to say that I think this is a matter that needs to, to be kept alive because the questions remain unanswered, the problems remain, uh, and uh, if you have the chance to see this film, I would certainly encourage you to do so, and also to take advantage of uh, you know, some of the liberties that we still have in making your views known. Uh, if you share my concerns about this tremendous tragedy uh, in which uh, approximately seven seven dozen men, women, and children, American citizens all, uh, were killed in a paramilitary operation uh, that need not have uh, gone forward even from the beginning, uh, that you let uh, your representatives know and the folks in Washington know that, uh, that indeed this is a matter that should not just be swept under the rug uh, and that, uh, that does indeed require uh, continual uh, looking at. So I do appreciate John's remarks in that regard, also his remarks about the problems of posse comitatus and the uh, the weakening of our uh, of the military's uh, capabilities, uh, not only uh, to protect our borders, but to protect and project our true national interests, national security interests abroad. Over the past 10 days, we've had two fairly interesting hearings on two of the committees that I serve on. 
Uh, one is the Judiciary Committee, and we had Attorney General Janet Reno before us uh, just uh, three or four days ago. And then last week, we had uh, the first actual hearing of the Government Reform Committee that I serve under, under Chairman Dan Burton. And uh, as, as we went through those, those two sets of hearings, and I'll comment on those also in a little bit later, the, uh, a uh, quote came to mind, and I looked this up to make sure I got it right. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings, and if our voices be heard and Clinton be impeached. I added the last part, but that, <laughs> that quote came, came to mind. Sometimes we can learn a lot from our colleagues overseas, and particularly in Britain, because we have such a tremendous tremendously strong common heritage. And I've always enjoyed listening to Margaret Thatcher, uh, both when she was Prime Minister as well as afterwards. She makes an occasional trip over here or through CPAC or some other organization, uh, has the opportunity to talk to us over here. And it always brings a little different perspective. And I think it's an important perspective sometimes that we keep in mind uh, that people from other countries, other cultures, see us. And it's important to get their perspective, particularly those who share a common heritage and understanding of society. Another gentleman uh, in that same mold is a, a young man by the name of William Hay. He is the new conservative leader in, uh, in Britain, the new leader of the conservative party. And rather than uh, simply wallow, wallow in self-pity, uh, as some of his colleagues have done since the tremendously devastating uh, conservative loss to the Labor Party just a couple of months ago, he really has been traveling throughout Britain uh, and uh, talking about uh, that this is an opportunity, uh, not a defeat so much as it is an opportunity to rekindle what, had made, what has made the Conservative Party so great in, in England and uh, throughout its history, and particularly in recent history with the, the Thatcher uh, government. And he gave a very interesting uh, speech, uh, uh, thanks to the wonders of Internet. I, I pulled it off the other day, and, and some of you all may want to do this. He, he gave this speech on October 10th. Uh, the Right Honorable William Hague, Member of Parliament, Friday, 10 October 1997. And this was the speech he gave to the Conservative Party Conference in Blackpool uh, on that day. And he made some interesting observations. He wasn't talking about America, but if you look at what he said, he was comparing the differences between the Labor Party and the Conservative Party. And I think what he says about the dynamics in England right now is very, very appropriate for looking at the differences between our parties and indeed what parties should stand for here in America. Uh, he made some very telling observations about the Labor Party standing for nothing except their own political success. He said, uh, and, and he was very eloquent on all this, I'm not going to read it, but just a couple of uh, highlights. He said that, that politics is and should be about much more than focus groups and polls. And he talked about uh, polls and reviews that the Labor Party goes through. And it made me think that, indeed, I think had our founding fathers polled the colonists in 1776, uh, it is probably doubtful that the figures uh, that resulted from that poll uh, would have uh, provided the numbers sufficient to make politicians of that era feel secure in calling for revolution. Thank goodness they didn't uh, decide the fate of our nation uh, by polls or reviews or focus groups back then. To paraphrase uh, a way that, uh, that Mr. Haig uh, dealt with this, he, he was talking about polls and reviews uh, that the, the Labor Party again uses in England, and, and he said, uh, imagine if World War II had been fought the way many modern politicians conduct the affairs of state. And then he, uh, he took a quote from uh, Churchill and uh, twisted it uh, the way it might come out nowadays. He said, we shall poll them on the beaches, we shall poll them on the landing grounds, we shall poll them in the fields and in the streets, we shall poll them in the hills, we shall never stop polling. Of course, if you know, they never we never would have won World War II if uh, you know the leaders, our leaders, uh, had had held their finger up to the wind and, and polled uh, whether or not certain things uh, ought to happen. It is disturbing, as you all know very very well, because the the, the heart and soul of of this great organization is uh, is American ideals, the American Constitution, what our founding fathers laid out for us, uh, and it is disturbing, and and it could very easily cause one to become very very cynical, which we aren't and you aren't, when you see what we're up against. Uh, just a few weeks ago, during that week when one wishes we celebrated the, uh, the Constitution, uh, it just went as just sort of another week, 
But there was one organization on the 15th of September in Philadelphia that gave one of these quizzes that you see periodically reported in the paper about the, the understanding or lack of understanding of American citizens and school kids uh, about our system of government. Uh, and if you, if you look at these, the polling results, I mean, a, a majority of uh, citizens polled don't know how many senators there are, much less how many representatives. They don't know what the three branches of government are. They don't know the difference between the Constitution uh, and the Declaration of Independence to say nothing about the Bill of Rights. They don't know what the Bill of Rights is, or they can maybe you know, cite freedom of the press or what they consider separation of church and state and so forth. But very, very cursory at best understanding of, uh, of American history and our institutions. And when we talk about the great issues that we ought to be debating, such as impeachment, uh, it makes it very difficult because we have a generation now, perhaps even two generations, of Americans that have grown up, a lot of Americans have grown up without being taught anything about our institutions or our history. They know nothing of the sacrifices that have been made to keep this country free and strong uh, and uh, the, the envy of the world. Uh, and the problem is that when the time comes to defend those institutions, whether it is from abroad or now from within, when the institutions of our country are under attack, if the American citizenry does not have a sufficient, even a basic understanding of what those institutions are in the history, then they don't know enough about them to even come to their defense. And that's the problem we're facing nowadays because the the institutions that were laid out by our founding fathers and which have been passed down to us through the, the succeeding generations, for their defense, they require an understanding of what our heritage is, what our institutions are, what a separation of powers mean. Why do we have that balance, that carefully crafted balance between military and civilian authority uh, that John uh, spoke about just a little bit ago. Uh, and we see what is happening in Washington nowadays, and then we compare that to, for example, the polling that seems to, uh, to be done on a, on a regular basis, and the two just, just don't match up. They don't match up if indeed you look at it in terms of are, is something happening to the institutions of how we govern ourselves as a society, and should we do something about them? The polls just don't match up. We saw it in the election last year. Uh, where organizations would poll, and they would poll, for example, vis-a-vis -vis President uh, Clinton, uh, and uh, people would say, yes, we don't trust him, but then on the other hand, they would say, we're going to vote for him. Uh, it just doesn't match up, and I think the reason it doesn't match up is because there's, there's very little, little attention devoted in our society to teaching uh, our, our citizens, our young people, as well as our adults, about the institutions of our country. And again, therefore, when they are under attack, and they are under attack with, by this administration as never before in our history, we don't seem to be able to rally public support to do something about it. And I think it is because people don't understand what those institutions are. They don't understand the need to defend them. They look to government for something very different from what government was intended to be. They look to government as an economic machine, pure and simple, an economic machine. So consequently, if the state of the economy is OK, then government is okay. And why should we worry about defending it? Why should we worry about these other things? Because after all, it's performing its essential function in the eyes of the public, uh, which is economic matters. You hear this on talk shows where people will call in and say, we don't, we don't care about all of these things. We just care about bread on the table and a minimum wage and health care insurance and so forth, uh, as if those are the only things the government was intended to address. And indeed, for many Americans, in their view, that's all government is intended to be, is an economic uh, institution. Uh, so therefore, when you try and talk to the to segments in the American population and sort of grab them by the, the collective collar and shake them and say, don't you understand what's doing to the institutions of our country where you have a president and an administration that has no concept of national security, that has no regard for national identity, uh, that is engaged in a systematic effort to sell off the institutions of our country and the decision making to foreign interests in many instances, people just sort of say, well, but the economy is doing okay. That's sort of the problem that we have, and I think it's, it's why it's so important uh, that we really focus on some, of, on some of these issues and really start to educate the American people, because also with, the, with regard to Congress, if members of Congress don't hear from their constituents, if they don't hear from, uh, from organizations, uh, opinion makers in their communities, 
that these issues, the issues of separation of powers, the, 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 the concept of decisions being made for American interests as opposed to communist Chinese or Indonesian efforts, uh, interests, uh, if they don't hear that these are important to us, then they're not going to pay attention to them in the Congress. Uh, but we are trying. The hearings uh, that, we, that we had just over the last two weeks, uh, uh, earlier this week we had, as I mentioned, General, uh, Attorney General Reno appear before the committee. She just went through this, this mantra whenever, I don't know how many of you all see it on C, saw it on C-SPAN, but every time she was asked a, a, a question, she said, uh, I'm going to call it as I see it. I'm going to call it as I see it. I'm going to call it as, uh, you know, just on and on and on. Well, the problem is she doesn't see it. Uh, she may call it as she sees it, but when you, when, when, when you sit there, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, and you don't see anything, well, it's very easy to say, I'm going to call it as I see it, uh, but she's not seeing it. It got to the point during the, during the, the hearing, uh, I took the opportunity of playing uh, just two very, very short clips from the most recent tapes that have been made available, for which I guess we ought to feel grateful that they made them available uh, uh, even now, nine months after subpoenas were served for the production of the tapes. But they furnished us some of them. And on one of the tapes that I, that I showed, it was just a very small clip. It was very obvious that there was a, a portion missing. It was at a point where, where President Clinton was, was addressing uh, a group of, uh, of, uh, of donors, including, very interestingly, sitting on one side of him and on the other side were two foreign uh, citizens, Charlie Tree and Pauline Kanchanilak, both of whom uh, have uh, given illegal uh, foreign uh, money contributions to the DNC, and both of whom are now overseas where we can't get them. Uh, but one was on one side and one was on the other. A congressman from California, Bob Matsui, gets up to introduce President Clinton, and all of a sudden there's a break, and it's a very obvious break, and then all of a sudden President Clinton is standing there. What was said there? We don't know. Uh, it's very interesting also that that same member of Congress uh, was present at the Buddhist temple uh, to which uh, President, uh, Vice President Gore spoke uh, last year, and that tape is completely missing. Uh, that There was a tape made of that, but it has been sent overseas. In showing that, that clip, and also in that clip, President Clinton makes very clear reference to John Huang uh, and having known that this event was coming up and was in, apparently involved in the planning of it, uh, and this was one of those events where large amounts of foreign money were raised that eventually had to be returned, then I turned to the, to the Attorney General and, and, and tried to elicit from her some, some reaction, uh, maybe some, some vague sense of unrest or outrage, and on, if not outrage, at least some, something unsettling about seeing this. Uh, and uh, none was there. I looked and none was there. I asked and, and she, she, she just uh, was not interested in this. The point is that uh, it, it, it is obvious, I think at this point, that, that if we are going to rely on the current institutions of our country, the Department of Justice, for example, or this, this anomalous uh, concept of an independent council, which is not a constitutional body, if we're going to rely on these new institutions, these new mechanisms, to, uh, to right the wrongs that we see and to, to make uh, government accountable, uh, it's just not going to happen. I, I really don't think it's going to happen. Uh, if we, you know, if eventually there is an independent council appointed, then that, uh, in large part, that will simply mean that, there, that, that we'll have lawyers arguing over technicalities uh, behind closed doors for two or three or four years, however long it takes. Uh, and what will come out of that, who knows? But it is not going, there is no way that an independent council can address the fundamental problems, uh, the abuse of power uh, in, uh, in uh, this administration in any meaningful way. The only mechanism, and I've concluded this, that the only mechanism that we have in order to make government accountable, this government accountable, to correct this, the very serious abuses of power, is to use the tool that, is, that is, was laid before us over 200 years ago, and that is the tool of impeachment. Impeachment. <laughs> Im Im impeachment uh, is in the Constitution. It is the only mechanism in the Constitution that is specifically designed to remove somebody from office who is abusing office. That was what it was intended to be. If you look at the writings of Madison, of Alexander Hamilton, and the Federalist Papers, if you look at the minutes of the, the constitutional debates in Philadelphia, there is very, very clear history, legislative history on this. Uh, there is far less, for example, on the Second Amendment. Uh, the Second Amendment, there is very little discussion of it, I think it was because it was, it was so, uh, I mean, it was, it was so commonly understood that the citizens have the right to keep and bear arms that there was not that need for long discussions about the wording of it. 
the, uh, the, the references to impeachment, though, are dealt with very extensively and very explicitly in the Constitution. The, war, the specific words that were used were put there for particular reasons, and each and every one of them has a particular history behind it. For example, when, when our Constitution talks about uh, being impeached and, rem and removed from office for high crimes and misdemeanors, it meant something very specific and very clear to our founding fathers. It, does, it did not mean, was not intended to mean, criminal offenses. Uh, high crimes and misdemeanors was a term of art that, we, that was used for, uh, at that point, uh, I think about 400 years of British history, uh, to mean abuse of office, maladministration in office. It had nothing to do with criminal offenses. Indeed, uh, criminal offenses are something entirely different. High crimes and misdemeanors in an impeachment concept uh, is meant to address a political wrong with a political solution, the political wrong being abuse of power, uh, the political solution mean, being removing that person from office. It does not convict them of a crime. It removes them from office. Indeed, if a person in high public office, uh, federal office, is convicted of a crime, that does not remove them from office. The only mechanism that removes them from office, short of being voted out of office, uh, and we've already failed in that effort in, in the last election cycle, the only mechanism we have is impeachment. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a tremendous void of understanding about what impeachment is, uh, and I find this even, even in the Congress. Uh, many people think that it means you have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt that a criminal violation occurred. Indeed, even when we had the Attorney General before us last, uh, last Wednesday, when we were talking not about impeachment but about an independent counsel, she, uh, in, in her remarks, was talking about the standard for the appointment of an independent counsel being proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It has nothing to do with proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But of course, that was her way of, of, of trying to impress the public uh, of, how, of how bright she was and how, and, how, and how assiduous she was going to be in standing up for the rule of law and why it was taking so long to do anything. Well, they completely missed the point, or maybe they don't miss the point. Uh, I'm not sure. But at, at any, in any event, the administration uh, is not going to correct itself. The Department of Justice uh, is serving right now as the defense lawyer for the president, not the defense lawyer for the people of this country. Uh, an independent counsel, as good as that might be in, in, in some particular areas, if our goal is to put a particular uh, criminal law uh, allegation under a microscope, sure, an independent counsel can do that, and, and lawyers can sit there all day long and they can parse and dissect and analyze uh, uh, the particular aspects of, of, of tiny pieces of evidence and whether or not they meet the criteria of a criminal offense, much the way, uh, for example, if you have and I use this analogy be, uh, with regard to the Attorney General, uh, what the Attorney General seems to be doing is serving as a traffic cop that comes upon a scene of a 50-car pileup, takes, uh, takes out a looking glass and determines that the 37th car in line had a, uh, had a taillight that wasn't working, you know, and cites the person for that. Technically, that's correct. Technically, the Attorney General has, the, uh, uh, you know, she's within her responsibility and jurisdiction to look at a particular tiny offense and see if it, uh, it you know, is proof beyond a reasonable doubt or not. But in so doing, they miss the big picture. And this administration is going to continue to miss the big picture because they don't want to see it. So the answer does lie elsewhere. And I think it lies in looking at, at, at impeachment. It is, it, it is a tool given to us for precisely this reason. I, I truly think that if our founding fathers had an opportunity to look at what was going on in Washington these days with this administration, first of all, I think they would be ashamed. Uh, and secondly, I think they would be rather angry uh, that we are squandering the opportunity to use the tools that they gave us, and I think it is a responsibility to do this, to right this wrong. You know, it's one thing to survive uh, an administration that, uh, that has a different uh, approach to welfare reform or a different approach to uh, some sort of, some, some aspect of economic policy. Uh, it is quite something else uh, to try and survive an administration uh, that has at its core no concept at all of our national identity, our national security, and our national interests. Uh, and they are indeed, they are literally selling those to the highest bidder, regardless of whether that bidder is foreign or domestic. Uh, and yet when I talk with my colleagues in the Congress about this, uh, some of them say, oh, but uh, President Clinton has a, a 65 or 61 percent approval rating. A fellow named Mark Halpern wrote an editorial in last week, I think it was last week's, a week ago Friday, Wall Street Journal, entitled Impeach. That was all, the Impeach. Uh, and one of the points that he made was that those who cite 
this 65 percent approval rating as proof that we can't hold Clinton accountable don't realize that he has a 65 percent approval rating because we won't hold him accountable. And if we take steps to hold him accountable, that will diminish. But if we simply sit back and say, oh, he has this high approval rating as reflected in the polls, and we can't do anything, well, of course, we'll never do anything. We have to, we have to attack the problem head on, and we begin that process by educating people as to what impeachment is, what it was intended to be, how it's been used over the course of our history, uh, most recently as well as uh, many, many years ago, uh, and that it indeed is the appropriate remedy to correct abuses of office, abuses of power that, that we're witnessing. There is no other tool that can do it. So your, your help in, uh, in, in, in doing that, beginning right now to, to, to talk about this issue, to educate people, to write members of Congress, get on the talk shows, write letters to the newspapers, will, uh, will really help an awful lot. And one thing that, that I hope it will do will be to ensure that uh, this book, which just hit the newsstand, that's by Bob Terrell uh, just a few days ago, uh, will not be uh, uh, a fiction. It's called The Impeachment of William Jefferson Clinton, and it is on the newsstand. And it is a docudrama, uh, i.e. fiction, but if we do our work, uh, it will not be fiction. It should not be fiction. It should be the reality, because it's the only way that we are going to uh, restore the reality of the American dream. Uh, thank you very much for having me here, John. Thank you.